So thank you all for joining us. We're thrilled to welcome you to the eighth program in our Judaica Project Lecture Series. In these monthly Zoom sessions on Judaica, Jewish art, and what these mean for Jewish, speakers present a different type of or topic related to Judaica or Jewish art in order to prompt discussion with and among the audience. Attendees are invited to ask questions and share their own experiences at the end of the session. This series is a collaboration with the Peter C. Harold House for Jewish Life at Quinnipiac University and is made possible by a generous grant from the Jewish Federation of Greater New Haven. Um, this evening, digital artist Cynthia Beth Rubin is going to share her work with us. Rubin's work flows across many forms of new media, including prints, videos, and interactive works. Based in New Haven, her studio practice extends from New York City to Rhode Island and beyond. As an early adopter of digital imaging, Rubin transitioned away from drawing and painting in the early 1980s. Recently, Rubin has been experimenting with combining plankton with medieval manuscripts. This work is inspired both by a residency in the Menden De 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 Dewar Lab at the University of Rhode Island School of Oceanography and research she, und she undertook in the late 1980s, exploring the motifs of cultural distinction in a tradition of ongoing commentary, inter reinterpretation, and embellishment. Rubin considers how the unknown meanings implied in the layered text interrelate with the unknown in science, as well as the similarities in pattern and form between microscopic life and decorative patterns developed hundreds of years ago. Welcome, Cynthia. I'm so glad to be here. This is really great. Um, I don't know how to mute people who are not in the middle of speaking. So, um, I mean, there's a way to kind of mute everybody, but someone was just driving. We were hearing Google directions. So um, if you're driving, um, it would be good if you could mute yourself. Okay, I am going to try to share my screen. Um, whoops, I guess that didn't work. Um, I tried to make um, keynote start automatically, and but it doesn't work if I'm trying to share the screen. So I'm going to go up here and start. So thanks to everybody at the Jewish Historical Society. I really appreciate this, and it's been wonderful to have conversations with Jake. Um, very inspiring, actually. So Here's, and the intro was was great. Better summary of what I do than I could do. So I've decided to start with the thank yous because otherwise they're at the end and then people forget to ask questions. So the thank yous from the 1980s are pretty important because um, those are the people who actually funded the research when I went to Europe and I you'll see the um, big libraries and then the current thanks is I've been, I used, I was at Rhode Island School of Design and used the microscopes. But for me, uh, the most wonderful things is being able to talk with other artists. Uh, and so people from the Jewish Art Salon, which actually have kind of kept my Jewish influence in my work going because the Jewish Arts Line was such a great group that I kind of had to go backwards and make sure I still had something <laughs> that was Jewish in my work. Um, I am part of a great group of called Tech Expressionists, and some of us have a virtual co-working group, and there are people here tonight from that group, um, and we meet together every Tuesday, and we work, and we do little critiques, and it's really been wonderful. Um, and then some of the other things is that I was part of um, the another group that met in New York that Linda Griggs started and Isaiah and SIGGRAPH, which are digital art organizations. So those have been really important for me. Um, I want to always start with like a little bit of what I'm doing now. So this was actually um, a couple a few years ago now, um, but it, it's the slide that Jacob used to entice people to come. And I do love this image. It was exhibited in Tech Expressionists and exhibited, um, it's just coming down. This weekend, it's also at the Stanton Street Shul in New York. It's been there for about a year. So if you're 
this Shabbat, you happen to be <laughs> this the Santa Street Shul, you'll see it. It's coming down um, in a week and a half. Um, and I'm going to talk about this more. I'm going to build to it. Um, there it is without all the text. And this is kind of a hot off the press image, which you'll wonder what this has to do with Hebrew manuscripts, but stay tuned. We will get to it. Um, so I want to put all this in the context of what artists do. So usually we think of art as narrative storytelling, stirring imagination, evoking memories, and finding some kind of aesthetic pleasure for people, um, kind of small goals, right? And what do we need in order to make that art? And these are all of the things that we need. You know, usually people start, or very often people start with good stories. And there are many people who are doing that in their work. They're very narrative. Um, I'm not really doing that. <laughs> I put it in there. Um, I'm working more on other ways to entice viewers and um, thinking about evoking memories, but evoking memories requires kind of shared cultural heritage and aesthetic pleasure. So where do we look for ideas for all of these things? Um, Mimi Shapiro, who um, passed away um, a number of years ago, was a really big influence. When I was in graduate school, we didn't have any women teachers and we didn't have any women visiting critics. And I made a big fuss about it. And because I was the one that made a big fuss, when we finally got to Mimi's studio, I was the one who had lunch with her afterward. And it was, you know, she was the same age as my mother. She was very nurturing and encouraging. And if you look at the picture in the background, you will see a fan and you will see things that look like they were influenced by quilts and other kinds of cultures. And Mimi was trying to look for feminist kinds of influences in her work, but she said, don't throw away the other stuff. Don't throw away um, all that good Western art, just integrate it, mix it together. And that was the most wonderful thing for me to hear. Um, I'm just throwing up the, where I took the picture from because I'm like a copyright freak. So it came from this New York Times article. Um, and finding sources for me that really touched me has been a lifelong quest as it is for most artists. I remember as a child going to the Metropolitan Museum and seeing a painting by a woman. I was like, a woman did this. I, you know, I didn't know until about... 30 or 40 years later that it was actually a Jewish woman who did this, although the family was practicing a progressive lefty um, Christian religion, but that kind of was like icing. Uh, I was so enthralled by that. Um, growing up, this was what was in the museums. This is what has influenced most of our art. And I actually thought that I used to take children's classes and the art gallery, the museum where I lived and Rochester. And I thought that I wasn't allowed to go up to upstairs where all this Renaissance work was. I thought it was a church and off limits for me. So it was really interesting to discover that um, our generation was always taught that there was no Jewish art. So it was interesting to discover that there was Jewish art. It's kind of a long story, but I found myself at the Jewish Museum in the early 90s, and um, there was a display of Hebrew manuscripts, and I never even knew that there was any Jewish art before. Of course, at the time, I couldn't, there was no digital photography, there's no, no one was allowed to take pictures, everything was off limits. So, this is basically what I had to work from. Um, so, I did a lot of drawings, I went to JTS, I was actually the first woman, the first artist at the female part. The first artist who had gone there and Evie Cohn, who was the li librarian of the manuscripts, really helped me quite a bit. And then I planned to go to Europe and do my big research. So imagine seeing this. Just imagine the moment that I was sitting in the Bodleian Library and this came out. It was just like a thrill to open it up, you know, I had to stay far away. Um, here's the reference of what it was. Um, and of course, why do I have these pictures? Because they're all online now. So things have really 
changed quite a bit. Um, I then set off doing, researching more. I was much more interested not in the illustration, but in the structure. Compositional structure was actually always a weakness for me as an artist. It just, you know, I loved color and texture, but I wasn't so good at compositional structure. So that's what I was really interested in. I couldn't find that actual drawing, this actual piece online. Some of them I found, it's been like a miracle week because I've been scanning these drawings that I haven't looked at since the 80s. And then I go online and go, wow, <laughs> there it is. Um, so when I was really, here's one of my drawings that shows my interest in how do I break up the space and the composition in a way that really shows that influence. And here's a watercolor that I did in the 80s. Now, remember, um, this was the 80s was also a time when people were reading Derrida and uh, many of the, the structuralists, um, even going back and reading Saussure and really thinking about how can you have different levels of representation. And I was fortunate in graduate school to study Hegel with some really wonderful people um, teaching at Johns Hopkins. And I can't remember their names now, sorry. Oh, David Sussman, okay. Uh, and so it was a really wonderful experience to be able to think about how do you, how do you capture, like what's in the manuscripts is different levels of representation at the same time, different parts of the composition uh, interacting with each other. Okay, I stuck this slide in case I forgot to say what I just said. Uh, <laughs> so going on at some of the other pieces that I saw in the 80s, this was amazing. And there's my drawing of it. Um, which you know, I had to sit there for hours and do these drawings, especially um, the librarians were pretty frustrated because they thought I was going too fast. But for me, it was like, uh, you know, a very slow, painstaking. Um, this kind of drawing is not my favorite kind of drawing. Um, this manuscript really was amazing for me. It was done um, in Poland as you can see in, um, sorry, not in Poland, Poling, um in France. Um, and lo and behold, I could not believe it. I just like totally flipped out the other night when I found it online. There it is. The whole thing is now online. So I do have some of the references for people who want to look at these later. But this idea of this beast devouring the text and in the Hebrew manuscripts, there's never, unlike the Christian manuscripts where there's one um, letter that is bigger, in the Hebrew manuscripts, it's the whole word. The, the words are not broken up that way. Um, and as we move along, I don't think you can see it in this, but maybe you can depending on your screens. The little beast on the side is made up of mycography. That's little writing that um, is really hard to read unless you had a magnifying glass. Um, it's amazing that people managed to even write it, but apparently they were really good at doing that. So, uh, and this was another manuscript that had beasts crawling up the top that uh, I drew in the Bodleian, kind of jumping back and forth here. Um, and again, a miracle, I found it online um, last night. I actually found it online and it, it blew my mind because those little beasts are really much more pronounced in the manuscript. I also, I guess I got really bored drawing the flowers. <laughs> um, not, nonetheless, it influenced this painting and a whole series of paintings where I took that structure. So it was the idea of compositional structure, of dividing things up. And in this painting, I left out the little beasts, which is incredibly interesting to me because of what I'm doing now. Um, and people who have followed my work know that I, after doing all of these painstaking drawings, uh, 
a couple years later, I went to Marseille I, in um, 87, 88, I had a sabbatical and I was living in Avignon so I could go to Marseille as often as I wanted to. It's like an hour, then it was an hour and a half on the train. And I get there and I take out my little colored pencils and my graph paper and Madame Jacoby, the uh, rare manuscript librarian said to me, oh, you can photograph it. Why don't you come back next time with your camera? I was like, wow, you really? Um, so, you know, I was very careful. She said, don't photocopy it. And I took it over to the window and stood on a chair over it, but I photographed it. And until very recently, I had the only photographs of it. So it was really important to me to keep, to work with it. Um, uh, started in 1988 working with it, um, at this point, I I became digital in the early 80s. I want to go back and show all the early digital. This is on a Mac 2 computer that in uh, right around the same time. Um, I'm sorry, it says 98 on here. It's 88. I guess I just got confused with the decades. Um, because when I came back from France, I had a big grant from the Connecticut Commission on the Arts to do a mural, a big commission. And so that gave me the funds to buy a color computer. So I had one when few people didn't. Um, and I put in my scan here um, just as a little historical artifact, because in these days, in 88, that was what a scan looked like. There was no, we didn't, there was no grayscale. When we said black and white, we meant black and white. And if you were lucky enough to have access to a scanner, a friend of mine had a commercial job that paid for her to have a scanner for a few weeks. And then she shared the wealth and we passed around this scanner. Like, this is really a big deal. We have this scanner. So I was able to scan this in and have the motif and then make the piece. And I did a whole series. A um, few years later, working with the composer, Bob Gluck, who I believe is here. I think I saw him on the call. We worked for many years to make a interactive version about this Bible. So I took all of those concepts and working with Bob, who um, also um, embraced these concepts, we dealt with the idea of creating a narrative. In fact, I decided um, for years, I'd been thinking about the Bible as like kind of alive. What if it were a live thing? So it traveled. The story of the Bible is that it was created in Toledo, Spain in 1260. It left with the expulsion in 1492 and went to Safat in um, what's now Israel uh, with uh, many people who left during the expulsion returned to Israel at that point. And, uh, and nobody knows what happened to it. <laughs> um, it was there for, for a couple hundred years. And then one day in the late 1800s, it showed up in the library in Marseille. And no one knows how it got there because there's a pretty good record of what was uh, what came in with the confiscated books during the revolution. So um, I think here's a little bit. Oh, I don't, yeah. This is Bob's music and Bob's programming, which was the real challenging part. stop that. Um, we had a stylist that you felt like you were reading the uh, book kind of with a pointer and it triggered different videos 
that represented different places where uh, the Bible may have been. So I am jumping ahead, watching the time, to 20 years later, and I started working with Plankton. Um, unrelated, I was teaching, I got, I was actually teaching a, a course at RISD, uh, Rhode Island School of Design, about cultural heritage and this whole idea of looking at different uh, artifacts in the museum from across cultures. But from that, I asked the students to go to our nature lab, which is really a library um, of artifacts. And at the same time, there was, or shortly thereafter, I asked them to, to go there to research nature and develop their own motifs. And shortly after that, we got these really fabulous microscopes and everybody started looking under the microscope and suddenly things became plankton. And so I moved into working with plankton. So it's very interesting how the cultural heritage idea, the idea of developing motifs from nature moved me into getting deeper into nature and kind of abandoning the cultural heritage part for a while. Um, but then um, Susan Turner, who is an artist in Winnipeg, invited me to be part of an exhibit on roundness. And this here we are into the pandemic. And so I started working with roundness and brought in plankton, but also Hebrew manuscripts again. Um, the Codex from Cairo, which is the oldest Bible. And it's actually in here as a kind of embossed texture and some ciliates that I drew and also some that were scanned. Uh, actually, they came from 3D scans done in the Menden Drawer Lab because I thought I was going to do something 3D. I didn't do anything 3D, but I used those scans. Uh, so as time went on, I really got interested in the Leningrad Codex, which, uh, as people know, was done in Cairo in, what is it, 1008. It's uh, and now in the library in uh, what's currently called St. Petersburg. And this amazing thing happened. I took this conglomerate of plankton that Jason, one of the people in the Mender and Durer lab, had developed a way of imaging what was in a drop of water, which actually is not that useful for the scientists. There's like too much stuff, but great for me. So uh, at this point, I had left Rhode Island School of Design, and I was am the artist in residence at the Mendon Durer lab. I am the, um, which just gives me privileges to take all their stuff and sit in on their meetings. Uh, and so I took these two seemingly totally disparate elements, the plankton and the manuscript, and I put them together. And wow, it was just unbelievable. Like they totally fit. There were circles and there were circles. And there's a serratium is the kind of plankton that looks like a triangle. And the serratium fit. And everything just is like, I couldn't believe this. They actually go together. And so that pushed this whole other body of work. Um, and this is how I got to the copepod in a Red Sea in old Cairo, um, where the copepod was looked like a beast. It's a very, very small, looks really looks like a shrimp, but there it was. Okay, I'm going to do a quick timeout to look at what some other artists have done with micography. Um, this one was just a total surprise for me. When I started Googling, I found this person in Germany. So it's not a new idea to go, oh, I want to modernize micography. And this is a close up um, because you couldn't see it in what I showed before of how the piece you're seeing in the right is the one that's totally made up of little writing. And here, he took the Song of Songs and made this whole piece out of it. Um, Susan Schwab is an artist that I actually met um, on this topic. 
the Women's Caucus for Art in uh, the early 80s actually had a session on motifs of cultural distinction. And there were two Jewish artists on the panel and Susan was the other one. And so we met over this idea of looking at manuscripts. This is a, a Sarajevo Haggadah that um, was done in Barcelona. You realize the manuscripts are named after the library where they are now, not where they were done. So if it can get a little confusing. Um, and there's her piece by itself without the manuscript next to it. Uh, Leah Caroline, who is a New Haven artist, um, did this piece looking at uh, a scroll of Esther for her daughter's bat mitzvah. Um, there's the scroll by itself. And here's her piece by itself. So you can see the influence of creating a scroll and being able to modernize it. Um, I'm not sure if Leia's here. I see Carol Mann is here. So um, Carol was really taken by the ceiling. Uh, she told me that she saw a film about the restoration of the ceiling in the synagogue, and I'm not gonna try to say the name of the synagogue um, that was being restored. And so she combined motifs from that and with her own background as um, growing up as a Cantonese um, artist in Hong Kong and combined it with her Jewish identity. And it's just a wonderful mix of playing of, of border and decorative motif um, really pulls us in. And um, Judith Joseph, who did something really interesting because she took a manuscript that actually is very decorative. It's uh, this is actually a ketubah, but there's no story. It's, it's Cuba marriage contract. The story is a the contract of the people who were getting married and she turned it into a story. So she took the motif and she took the idea of bordering and some of her other work. So put it all together and did this woodcut. And I'm not sure if she's here or not because I can't, I can only see about five people. Okay, so now I'm jumping through, like racing through a lot of my history, but I wanna get to what I'm doing right now. So, uh, in our text expressionist group, we've been talking about borders. And I started this piece last spring looking at a fragment of uh, a text that was done in Cairo, I believe. Um, I have to say I hate Pinterest because whenever you Google something to find the source, it just brings you to people's Pinterest pages without any source material. So I can't, I have to go back and find exactly where I got this from. But uh, in our text expressionist group, we've really been talking about the concept of borders. And so this is kind of where I am right now playing with borders uh, in the spring in June. I went back to Rhode Island School of Design and used an electron microscope and really got in to see these little uh, diatoms very close up and started colorizing them. So there's the original one and the colorized one. And the objects up in the upper left are grains of salt. So that gives you an idea of scale. You're seeing salt and then you're seeing uh, the the diatoms, but unfortunately they didn't come out very clear because we we didn't prepare the slide. We didn't have enough time to prepare the slide, but I liked that, um, that it didn't come out. And so this is the piece that evolved from that. Uh, this is pretty recent. It's October. It's pretty large, like 
like this far. You can't see my hands go this far across. Um, and it's glued together with different pieces. Now, what does this have to do to, with Hebrew manuscripts? Well, if you remember back to this piece that I talked about, I realized in the back of my mind all this time, in, since the 80s, I've been thinking about things crawling around in the borders and the idea of what the borders do in little beasts who work their way in. And in fact, I think that was part of my interest in plankton. And so here I have a few details so you can see how there's like little beasts around and also within it and over on the side. And this is a combination of photographic material and drawing. I put them both in um, and these things go in and out of the computer so many times. Sometimes I have to rub it myself to see, is that a piece that I drew or is it something that came out of the computer? Is it photographic material? Um, so there's a serratium down at the bottom here in the detail that's photographic, and then there's the hand-drawn serration, and then there's a diatom up above it, um, and there's the piece. And to return to this idea of the beasts, uh, this is another manuscript that I, I don't think I took the time to draw, but probably influenced me when I saw it in the British uh, library. So there's a big difference you may have noticed between the manuscripts that were done in Spain that are highly decorative and the ones that were done in Germany or northern France, as this one was. Um, and in these, what, what the texts say is different in some of them. It's just telling you how to chant if you're reading it, where the accents are, and other ones it's poetry, and I am not the expert in that. I'm really approaching this as just give me ideas. So um, here are a few other manuscripts that I saw just to get people excited about doing their own research. I actually didn't see this in person when I was in the UK, but it was an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum a few years ago in New York. So some of you may have seen it then, but it always influenced me having seen it in a book. Uh, I did go to Jerusalem eventually and see some manuscripts there. And uh, this is another one that I did not see in person uh, because it's in Poland. Um, but it was always interesting to me because of the circles and the arch. And um, in a, another lifetime, um, in some of my other talks, you can see how for about 15 years, I kind of went down this rabbit hole of being interested. Well, it was a good rabbit hole. I don't know if rabbit hole is the right phrase because it was a good thing of being interested in how there's architecture in the manuscripts and then finding places in Europe as I traveled around that echoed that and then doing compositions that had to do with place. And obviously this is a Haggadah that I did draw at the British Library because here's my drawing. And I, it's got the little beasts down at the bottom. And I did not yet look to see if this is online because that's like, takes all my time and why I've been doing all these all-nighters. And so here I am, I'm starting to collage together. These are taking some of my older works and cutting them up. Older might even be just a month ago and mixing them with drawing and thinking about the border and thinking about what happens if you have something that's central and you have something that's dancing around it and the layers of meaning. Um, this is really hot off the presses because I kind of, the people who are in my text expressionist group, it keeps changing and I just changed it a little bit like this morning. Uh, <laughs> I think it's done now because this is being recorded. So here we are. Um, on the right is what I got printed. So I started with that print, which came from looking under the electron microscope at the salt and the uh, diatoms and texturing it quite a bit. And again, in and out of the computer and then adding to it the idea of what the borders and then extending out of the border and really pushing this idea of dancing around the meaning. 
And so if you compare this to what I was doing when I was very literally looking at the structure of the manuscripts, um, it's, you know, there's still something there. Although uh, to me, uh, many years later, you know, the 40 year gap, um, it's still the same person. And there it is by itself. And then I'm going to end with um, really what I think of where, where I started. Now I showed you this in the beginning. Now, if you start looking at these details and seeing where that's pencil, I just picked up the pencil. Oh, the other big thing was like waking up one day and going, wait a minute, I'm getting these printed. I'm playing with the borders. The borders don't have to be white. So this is really a new direction for me to let the borders be a color and move more into the painting or the imagery that way. So here's the top where you can see some guys in there and um, over on the right. And there we are. This is what I'm going to show you of my work. I said 40 minutes, I think I just about did it. Uh, there are, I'm, I, did not write down all of the resources as I was going along and then quickly tried to go back and kind of ran out of time. Here are a couple, um, but I'm sure everybody here is a really good Googler and you can Google on your own. And it is amazing because what I had to go through with getting letters in order to, you know, if I hadn't been teaching at a college, and I was teaching the art department. I mean, I was just as much an artist as, you know, people who didn't have that those credentials, but I never would have gotten to see any of the manuscripts otherwise. Um, so that's kind of amazing. And here are some places to see my work. Um, and you can see a lot of other interviews and talks. Um, I gave a long talk at Becky at our, our synagogue in the spring and I'm almost done editing that talk. So if you want to see what happened in the middle, you can go to the Becky site. There's I'm doing it in segments. So a lot of it is online. Uh, and down at the bottom, uh, that may seem a little strange to you, hubs. It's a 3D exhibition space that those of us in tech expressionists are part of this group, Siberiana and everybody has their own little gallery space, their own room. So I think this is where I am going to end. And um, I also see that Daryl Cooperstock is on this call and she is an, another artist who has done, she's actually done mycography. So I mm -hmm. apologize for not reaching out and getting an image I because no apology needed. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's done absolutely amazing work. And Gerald, you may not know this, but one of your pieces was on exhibit in at Becky in the fall because Oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> Which piece? Well, I'll talk to you later. <laughs> well, we'll talk about it. We did uh exhibit from people's homes and um mm -hmm somebody had one of your pieces. So huh. a lot of people here have seen your work recently. So great. I, I hope I made it. Uh, I, thank you so much, Cynthia. That was amazing. So like I, to, to give some context, like we always cover a lot of ground, right? And it's easy to do, right? Um, but the, I knew that we were gonna be coming from like Hebrew manuscripts to Plankton and we did marginalia and we did St. Simonism and we did, uh, you know, ceiling painting. I got obsessed with um, with um, ceiling painting in, in churches, in art history, in, in college. Um, and so now I have to look at that synagogue. Um, and we covered, you know, digital art and Mac 2s and, um, you know, gatekeeping in uh, academic institutions that was really truly amazing um <laughs> and the thing that i so so the thing that i think is useful in so a lot of what you you brought ties ties into our previous you know conversations we've we've 
just started doing fine art as a topic. Um, and it's it's been really different from the material culture stuff we were doing, and it's great. Um, but the thing that I've been thinking about is that um, next week or next month, we're doing a um, genealogy talk, and it is going to be part of the Judaica series. And I've been kind of thinking, how does this fit? And I love that you took this talk as an opportunity to do kind of like your personal history. Um, and I was thinking, because I was trying to make this fit today, and I was thinking, you know, what is more, you know, material and Judaica and art than like ourselves? Um, so, yeah, you just really brought it all together for me, and I really appreciate it. Um, and Carol, who who was the, who's the artist who looked at the ceilings, is on this call. Oh, so. excellent. Um, so 